All right, everyone, thank you for coming back to the channel. And I'm excited because today I'm going to be revealing my new genetic data from GB Health Watch. This is the GB Insight report. Uh, I am excited because I'm being joined by their team, uh, Christina, Megan, and Mendel, and my good friend and colleague, Spencer Nadowski, who will be acting as my doctor in this case. Uh, so I, of course, want to emphasize none of this should be taken as medical advice. Please be sure to work with your doctor. And here to kind of give us a quick overview is Mendel. So, yeah, so GB Insight was developed um, to offer a broad and comprehensive uh, genetic risk of cardiometabolic diseases um, that includes uh, dyslipidemia, diabetes, obesity, and uh, genetic risk for atherosclerotic, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or ASCVD. Um, and so there, there's a multitude, and it's kind of heterogeneous as far as the risk factors that contribute to these. And so our genetic panel takes a comprehensive view of the underpinnings or the, the uh, biochemical underpinnings to that and then assesses the genetic risk for that. So as I understand, the next generation sequencing is great because you actually are capturing a lot of the uh, unusual genetic variants that we don't normally see in these reports. I mean, certainly I've seen some unusual ones I've not seen in any of the tests that I've done before. Is, is that right? Yeah, and that's that's what NGS, next generation sequencing, allows for is that it's, it was initially uh, termed uh, massive parallel sequencing, which basically allows you to sequence uh, you know, many genes at once and look at all the various different flavors and genetic variants um, within a certain gene. Like, and some people, can I just pitch, because I see Spencer dozing off, can, can we get his side in and then so he doesn't have to see me muck around so much? Yeah, you know, no, what, busy I, day. what I was going to say is like, look, so like from a clinician standpoint, I have a guy like Dave coming in who has a phenotype that looks like a familial hypercholesterolemia, right? And I get a lot of these patients, I send them off for uh, one of these monogenic uh, testings that does LDL receptor deletions, mutations, ApoB, PCSK9, and LDL related. Um, and it comes back negative. And it's like, okay, well, I guess, obviously for Dave, we were talking about the ketogenic diet, high saturated fat, all these different things. But there are other people who aren't on a saturated, high saturated fat ketogenic diet who also have these, this phenotype, but it's, it comes back negative on, on one of these other genetic tests. The reason I would, I've worked with your company is because it looks beyond that and comprehensive. Uh, the, the, some of these things that you see in the, in the uh, Mendelian randomization, you see these uh, genes coming out. So from my standpoint, it can find some of these other things that look for more of that polygenic uh, uh, hypercholesterolemia that give you clues that may help with lifestyle or whatever, but also give us some more information of how to treat this person in front of us. That's why I like it. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into my data. Now, you may want to reference the prior video where I did the little swab test. I sent it in. A few weeks later, I get this report back. It's extremely comprehensive. <laughs> There's really way more stuff than we're actually gonna be able to uh, cover. Uh, so we're, we're just gonna kind of hit the headliners. And there was even one that Spencer texted. I didn't wanna tell you because I wanted you to be surprised. <laughs> so um, <laughs> let's jump into it. We're gonna, we're gonna actually get to uh, the part where it's actually in the summary. There's B variants of uncertain significance and high risk variants for which I have six that are listed. And the first of those is ABCG8. And um, I'm curious, um, Spencer, was this the one that you were the most interested in from the report? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I was interested in the whole, the comprehensive uh, scoring of it. But that is probably the most interesting one. Because you're on a high fat carnivore ketogenic diet, and that's one of these one of these little things, uh, it's, they call it the bilge pump. I know people have followed Dr. Dayspring, talk about the Neiman Pick C1 like protein that allows the sterols in, but then it, if you have some sterols that aren't supposed to be coming in, it, it shuttles it out. Now you have a mutation in that, so maybe there's some dysfunction, you're allowing too much sterol 
in and not pumping it back out. To clarify, this is kind of, to clarify you're talking dietary sterile. So di the part you might sterile. skip past Correct. is, in other words, food I'm consuming uh, in it are sterols, including cholesterol and phytosterols. And for that matter, how much my gut would absorb them in a normal circumstance could get altered by this genetic variant, correct? Yes, and that could explain some of your serum lipid levels. Good. Yes, and to be fair, another thing that you would ask, uh, of course, you already know my history fairly well, uh, even before we'd had a chance to meet, is how much there was perhaps higher cholesterol before I'd gone on a ketogenic diet. We already know from my history that my LDL was closer to say 120s to 130s. And I think it's worth emphasizing just briefly that a lot of these variants that show a higher uh, preponderance of LDL from a genetic perspective often aren't that degree of difference in how high or how low they may be relative to what we see, uh, Spencer, certainly what we've seen in the population that we're looking at with lean mass hyperspawners. In other words, diet seems to have generally a much bigger effect in this context in being like, say, on a fat uh, being on a low carb, high fat diet for those people who are especially lean and athletic. And it's, it's why it's a central focus for us and in, in our study. Um, Mendel, did you want to comment a little bit on the ABC G8? I look all the way to the far right column. It says likely pathogenic. Uh, hmm. Mendel, does that mean I should be concerned about this, this mutation in particular? Uh, not necessarily. It's uh, like I said, it's it, the evidence is not conclusive to assess that it's likely pathogenic. Um, and that's why we've set we've assigned it or classified it as VUS likely pathogenic. Um, but uh, the evidence points to it and we use various algorithms to assess whether a, a genetic variants will be deleterious to, to the, the protein. Um, but mind you that it's computational. And so uh, as, as of yet, there is no functional or conclusive evidence to indicate that that is pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Now, one thing that I like is in each of these, you can further expand it out and you have not just studies that you link, but also notes as to why it is that you came to um, these different scorings and summaries that you have, which is just absolutely fantastic. I want to hit one more. Actually, I'll hit two more, but one more that was the one that I think caught Spencer's eye the most was this combinatorial score that you have. Um, Spence, can you, can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah. So from a phenotype, you look like FH, like we said before. And so it's like, okay, is there something going on here? Well, there is something what people refer to as polygenic FH, which I, there's some debate over the, that nomenclature. I, I, I agree that it should be called probably polygenic hypercholesterolemia because it, FH is different, but you don't have a, mo a monogenetic cause of your high LDL, but you have a score of 99. And I actually asked Mendel before, cause I was like, hey, Dave doesn't know his score yet. The report was sent to me. I asked Mendel like, can you describe what this means? Because different companies have different scoring systems. And uh, Mendel, maybe you can, ex you, you wrote the email to me, but basically <laughs> you're, in, you're at the top, that you almost have the highest score for what the polygenic uh, score would be. And which means that you would have higher, expected to have higher than population normal levels of, of LDL cholesterol. Yeah, so the, the, our polygenic score is essentially a percentile score of of the of, of people in your uh, ethnic population, so in your case, it would be based on European, um, based on popula population genetic uh, databases, and um, so what that means essentially is that the percentile, uh, so at, at the 99th percentile, so essentially your genetic your cumulative genetic score that we've assessed you're at the high, you're essentially at the 99, 99% uh, of, of people are below your score essentially within that population genetic database uh, using our score. Now, so if, if, if you don't mind, the thing is with this, with your phenotype and doing this LMHR, there are a lot of skeptical people out there who think that 
this is all caused by gene genetics, right? Like, but we actually, from a phenotype, phenotypical standpoint, you had population normal levels before doing this. And we even, you know, doing our study, that was part of our cutoff. We used the Dutch scoring system for FH to go like, look, we wanna make sure using a phenotype that people likely don't have FH. But now from a polygenic standpoint, there's something there. Now we don't know what it is for other uh, people that have ketogenic induced hypercholesterolemia. But for you, it's really interesting because it's like, okay, you do have a 99 here. I don't know. I don't know if that's the cause of it or what. Well, yeah. And I have two things to say to that. One, we don't know, but we're about to find out because GB Insight was the, the company we are so excited to be partnering with for our LMHR study, which is going on right now. And so we're going to be getting a lot of that data back to, to find out. And I'm, I'm thankful that, that GB Health Watch is going to be doing a lot of the analysis for that. Uh, but the other part is, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mendel, because we have talked about this a little bit offline before, the, the score is really more of what the likelihood of my observing higher relative levels of LDL are. I think a lot of people might assume that the score could be one of two things, either one that I should, should expect my LDL cholesterols to be in like the 99th percentile of like the population, you know, distributed. Uh, it's not that, as, as I understand it. And two, that it's not, it's not even so much necessarily associated with risk as it is the likely outcome of observing higher levels of these lipids. W would that be an accurate uh, summation? Uh, yeah, and the, the, like I said, just, just to qualify a little bit though, is we are not making, our, our panel looks at the genetic, uh, the cumulative genetic variants that will contribute to potential phenotype, in this case, uh, hypercholesterolemia. Um, we can't say there, you know, there, there isn't this linear sort of cause and effect between them because, you know, your ex, your, your, all the other stuff that, that goes into, uh, you know, your, your lifestyle, basically, you know, exercise and all the various things that you eat will also, you know, modify that. But what our test essentially does is it looks at the genetic risk of, of, uh, you know, one of these lipid endpoints. I mean, in effect, there's this term I hear often. Uh, I'll be curious to see if Spencer agrees that genetics loads the gun and lifestyle mm -hmm. pulls the trigger. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, genetics load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Whatever, it's all the same. Same concept, yes. I'll have to I'll have to update my memes. I wonder if there's anybody who tweets a lot of memes that are out there. Maybe you can recommend <laughs> people, Spencer. <laughs> So I want to hit one more variant. I was already aware of this one. Uh, it's kind of, as you could say, a low hanging genetic variant fruit, uh, but it's the APOE status. So sure enough, it was confirmed that I have uh, one allele of the APOE4. And uh, Spencer, do you, do you treat patients who have the APOE4 uh, differently? Do you, do you think that they are at a higher relative risk than others? It's very... <laughs> Sorry. Here, my, my hand. Oh, God, he's got bubbles. Hold on a second. Um, you have bubbles? Here. Yeah, he, he's about to pour them all over the place. Can you say, Luca, can you say hi real quick? Hi. Say hi. hi. Okay. We're going to need hey. a release from him later. <laughs> okay, so I don't actually treat my ApoE4 patients much differently. Like from a lifestyle standpoint, yes, there's some probably some modification with saturated fat, but you only have one copy of it. Honestly, like it has a small effect, but it's not, it's in, in you, I wouldn't expect it to be the major effect for your phenotype. Um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it here. Spencer, I wanted to once again, thank you for coming on board. And also, of course, we're doing a large perspective uh, study with me. And I wanted to thank GB Health, Health Watch, your GB Insight report. I'm excited about it. I'm going to be kind of coming through it. But where could we find more on your company and the services, and for that matter, where we can get this, this test done? So if you navigate to the bottom of this video, there will be a few different links there. You can learn more about our the panel that we discussed today, which is our dyslipidemia and ASCVD comprehensive panel. It includes analysis of 143 genes. So you can peruse kind of all the functionality behind those and how they how your different genotypes may influence uh, different lifestyle and um, medical decisions that you make in your life to prevent um, chronic disease. So yeah. Click on any links below the video and you can reach out to us anytime with questions.